Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope everyone's having a great day. As always, this message has been pre-recorded, so uh, it won't self-destruct once it's done for anyone who gets that reference. Um, did get out and vote today for those who are in the United States. It's our national election day. Of course, by the time you're watching this, it's Wednesday and we've already moved past that, but hey, figured I'd still rock the sticker. So today, a little bit of a curveball in our schedule because we were supposed to be covering fabric operation today. And the reality is those who were with us last session and uh, maybe those who have caught up by watching it after the fact realized that we didn't quite get through all of the material. And it's really hard to talk about the fabric operation if we don't know what the architecture is like. So we are going to be talking about the network architecture today of, of software defined access. And then in the next session, we will be diving into fabric operation for real this time with Lisp and VXLAN and Cisco TrustSec. Uh, that's going to be a good conversation for anyone who is able to make it uh, in, in two weeks when we talk about all of these technologies. So I love, I mean, VXLAN and Lisp are so much fun. <laughs> um, but I will say that it wasn't too long ago that when I heard those acronyms, uh, I would freak out. And so I understand if you hear those acronyms and you're like, I have no idea what Lisp is. I have no idea what VXLAN is. Uh, trust me, I've, I was there not too long ago and it all said and done, uh, or all things considered, it's not that bad to pick up relative to some of the other uh, protocols and changes to our industry that are out there these days. So as far as our agenda is concerned, again, we're going to be talking about the architecture. And really, it's going to boil down to these four different layers that we have to talk about. And these aren't OSI model layers. These aren't like core distribution access layers. We have a lot of layers in the networking world, unfortunately, and Cisco just gave us four more. Uh, it does start with physical and network layer. Uh, one of these days I'll move this monitor over here. So when I look over here, it looks like I'm looking at the agenda. <laughs> For me, it's over here. Um, so we're going to be starting with the physical layer and the network layer, which do happen to match with the OSI model, but it has nothing to do with OSI. And then from there, we're going to be talking about the management, I'm sorry, the controller and the management layers as well. Most of this conversation is going to be spent on the physical and the network layers. And then the controller and the management layers are not too bad of a conversation, but we have we, we need to know what's in there. So if you happen to be studying for the Encore, this is going to be a very important part of learning Encore. I'm going and taking the exam, you have to be able to speak SDA. Uh, right now, I'm actually in the middle of recording for the design specialization, the ENSLD, as Cisco calls the exam. It's you know, all these great acronyms, right? So ENSLD is the design specialization. You can get your CCMP by passing the Encore, the core exam, and then any one of these specializations. So we just at CBT, we just released the SD-WAN specialization course. So if you're thinking about certifying with SD-WAN, then that is available at CBT Nuggets. But if you are thinking about the design course, then SDA is absolutely a big part of the design exam. So if you're going to go take that exam, uh, you're definitely going to want to study up on SDA. And by the way, I guess I did mention last time I was going to be going and taking the exam. Uh, I think it was the next day, wasn't it? I ended up passing. So um, it's, you know, I mean, I'm living and breathing in Encore land. So it was a lot of the same materials from Encore. Plus I've been doing network designs for like the last eight years of my life. So uh, a lot of on the job experience helped me with that. And so if you're not, if you don't find yourself in that boat, then, then don't worry about it. I would dare say the ENSLD, I'm not going to, I probably shouldn't weigh in on, it wasn't as difficult of an exam as I was expecting, but it certainly has its challenges. And so the, the neat thing about ENSLD is it feels a little bit like Encore, but thinking about it differently because you have to learn a lot of the same topics on, you know, if, if you're going to pass Encore, you've got to learn OSPF and EIGRP and you have to learn multicast and I think IPv6 is on the blueprint. Um, maybe not. I should check that. But <laughs> I know I didn't teach it for CBT Nuggets. That's usually what ends up mattering, I guess, more than anything to me. Uh, <laughs> well, I know it at least. But um, you have to know these topics in order to pass Encore. And so once you've passed Encore and you know a lot of these uh, subjects, you just have to know them a little bit different light. You have to understand how these work from a design perspective. So um, anyways, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I will say that I, I'm a huge fan of design. I know a lot of you out there in this group especially are very focused on getting that design certification. It's it's It feels to me like the certification that can potentially take you to a different job role. Because if I get the ENS DWI, then fantastic. And you're going to be one of the few people who really know and understand Cisco SD-WAN. But now if you really want to use that, you've got to find an organization that maybe uses SD-WAN if your organization doesn't already use it. 
And so that's knowledge that could quickly become rusty versus you get the design and now you can start applying for network uh, architecture roles or network architect roles. You know, take the job that I had, right? <laughs> Where it's like, you're just doing designs, whether it's designed for an organization or you take a job with a consultant and a Cisco partner and you're doing designs on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, we, there's a huge need for that out there. And the network design is arguably one of the <laughs> least likely uh, parts of our job that's likely to be taken over by automation. Uh, anybody can go out and click a few buttons to automate the deployment of something, but you can't really click a few buttons and automate the design of, of the network. So just random, random set of thoughts. Um, we're going to end with getting to SDA. I didn't know what how else to describe. I didn't want to say migrate to SDA because then it sounds like, hey, we're going to actually walk through every single step of the process. Really what I, what I want to do is show... In a lot of cases with software to find access, and actually here, let me just flip over. We end up with these types of drawings where we have this VXLAN cloud and we've got all these switches. And we're going to start with that diagram today, but I want to actually show how this would map in a campus environment. So I didn't want to like make it sound like we're doing the migration elements, like here, you know, you have to switch this over to a layer three link and then you have to, you know, configure this IP address and then configure that protocol. Well, it's, it's going to be a much higher level version of that. But I really want to make sure that you can see how this technology would map to your organization, uh, to your network, whatever, whatever network it is you're working on. One thing I do want to say, as always, for those who are tuning in maybe for the first time, this is a study group. It's kind of, a, it's kind of an interesting study group. I, I don't know how, like, everybody's got a different vision for what a study group looks like. And, you know, I mean, I was always, you know, in college, if I was in a study group, it was more like I would work, you know, side by side, you know, quietly until I get to something that I can't figure out. And then I'm asking my buddy and hoping that they can drag me through <laughs> this difficult topic or what have you. So this study group is more along those lines. We're all from different parts of life, different walks of life, different walks in our networking journey. Some of us have a lot of experience. Some of us have not so much experience. Fantastic. All of us can learn together by kind of coming around a topic like this and realizing, okay, well, we've all got some questions around this and some people will chime in with questions maybe that you hadn't thought about and it's an opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you're watching this live, chime in with the chat anytime with any question about software to find, oh, look, I left SD-WAN principles up there. That's fantastic. That should say SD access architecture. <laughs> all right, well, we'll just leave it like that. Um, Chime in with the, to the chat anytime if you're watching this live. Ask a question about SD Access Architecture. That's what I was going to say. Or, or if you happen to be in SD-WAN, ask an SD-WAN question. That's great. We've already covered SD-WAN, so make sure you go back and watch those videos if you have some more in-depth questions. But at the same time, I'm in the chat right now because, again, this has been pre-recorded. I'm in the chat. We have a lot of other individuals who are studying for uh, the certification that maybe have already covered some of the parts that maybe you may might be struggling with. And so maybe we can all come together and help each other out. All right, that's my spiel. Um, does the, the whole TLDR thing, which is, you know, if you came in late and you didn't, you didn't catch the whole nine yards of this, the um, fabric, oper we were supposed to be covering software defined access fabric operation. We're gonna bump that to next week. And this week we're gonna be covering the architecture. So without further ado, we're gonna dive in and the first, uh, I guess the component of the architecture is going to be the physical layer. So when we talk about the physical layer in software defined access, really what we're doing is we're, we're looking at this network diagram and we're gonna to start to assign roles to this. Now we talked about this at a very high level in the last session, but now it's time to do the dive a little deeper. Okay, we have four different roles we need to consider. We have the fabric edge node. The fabric edge node is primarily going to be uh, a lot of what we, I'm trying to think of how to say it, most of our SDA fabric is going to consist of fabric edge nodes. Okay, the other ones, we've got control plane node, border nodes, and wireless controllers. We're not going to have a ton of those, but we're going to have a ton of fabric edge nodes. So when I look at this diagram and I see that I've got two switches connected to this network and I've got clients hanging off of these, these are going to be fabric edge nodes. Now I'm writing FEN, F-E-N for fabric edge node. I've never seen that as an official abbreviation, so don't get too excited by that. I'm just marking it down without having to write the whole thing out. But So we've got fabric edge nodes there at the edge uh, that are connecting. It's where our clients connect. Okay, 
So if I think about this from a campus architecture perspective, in a lot of cases, I know like when I was managing the network or helping to manage a network for a large uh, medical clinic, we had a large site and with like 16 or 20 access layer closets and every one of those access layer closets, there were a pair of 4,500 chassis switches. Well, those 4,500s were connecting to hundreds of users out of every single access closet. And so that would essentially be what these are. I'm looking at access layer switches in an access layer closet that's connecting directly to clients. That would be a fabric edge node. Next, we have the fabric border node. Let me just write that down. I've got a lot of things that start with the word fabric. And I've always joked that Cisco loves the word fabric because, uh, you know, going back to the data center days when it was all about fabric path and, um, you know, so they had fabric extenders for the Nexus line and fabric interconnects for the UCS. Uh, fabric path as a technology was basically, honestly, it was replaced by VXLAN, not replaced, but fabric path was Cisco's first foray into transporting layer two packets across layer three fabrics. And that's where fabric path came from. Uh, VXLAN was the industry standard version and it became far, uh, I guess forward more adopted, uh, which which is expe exactly what Cisco expected. So all of Cisco's fabrics now are built on VXLAN instead of Fabric Path. Um, for those who have, you ever, anybody hear about Trill? You remember that? That was like a big deal in 2012, and it, they had uh, was it Radia Perlman, the uh, the creator of Spanning Tree Protocol. She was in on that project. Um, Trill, the something interconnect of lots of links. I don't remember what the TR stood for, but it was like one word, like the, not transparent, trans something. Chime into the chat if you know what Trill stands for. Um, but it was um, same concept, right? The idea is that we want to push layer two over layer three. And so if we think about it from a, um, I guess I'm not, I guess I'm jumping back to Fabric Edge node, but if we think about it from the perspective of a campus network, oftentimes these VLAN or these clients might all be on the same VLAN, let's say like VLAN 100. And so if I'm building a layer three fabric here where all of my access layer switches are connecting to each other at layer three, well, we know from traditional network design that as soon as I hit a layer three boundary, I can no longer expand my VLANs. And this is why we use VXLAN. We're going to form tunnels through this network and allow us to send layer two information across that tunnel. And this is what we're gonna be covering in more detail N not next, I always want to say next week, but it's next session in two weeks since we meet every two weeks. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind that that's what's happening here. But the reason why, you know, I, I want you to have a little bit of this information because we are trying to, you know, think through this holistically and you're trying to understand every little bit and piece of it. I just don't necessarily like it to say like, hey, just trust me, this is a VXLAN domain and, and they're all connected to layer three and you know, that's a whole lot of black box magic that's happening. And, you know, we need to understand a little bit of how that works. So all of these switches have tunnels to each other and that's how we're transporting layer two. So all these clients can still be on the same VLAN. The fabric border node is simply going to operate in the same way as a fabric edge node, other than it's not connecting to clients, it's connecting to the rest of the network. And when I say the rest of the network, what I mean is this is the non SDA domain. We are not running software defined access. So really ultimately what that means is any any switches that are up here are not sending VXLAN tunnels down into the domain. I mean, if they were, then they would be part of the SDA environment. Because that's, those are switches and we might have clients up there, you know, hanging off of whatever. Maybe the data center is up there, for example. That's a pretty common one. So I've got all these servers attached to my data center switches that are off of this fabric border node. So I'll do, whoops, I'll do fabric border node. Again, not an official abbreviation, FBN, but fabric border node is what that type of switch is. And in a lot of cases, we're gonna have a couple of these fabric border nodes for redundancy because we really need, um, need to make sure that we can reach non-SDA parts of the environment. All right, um, what's next? Ah, yes, uh, let me switch colors here so things don't get too boring. Next, we have the fabric control plane node. Fabric control plane node. See, when I'm making a nugget, I'll just say like fabric control plane node, and then I'll just sit here in silence and write it all out. Silence. 
And then in post editing, I'll just like smush it down so it makes it sound like a, it makes it look like I write it really fast. Anyways, can't do that live <laughs> or pre recorded. I'm not editing this. Uh, fabric control plane node. A fabric control plane node is usually a router, actually. Um, I'm trying to think if there might be a couple of. Uh, no, no, I know there are a couple of platforms. There are a couple of switching platforms like the 6800s that can serve as a control plane node. But for the most part, there's going to be a router like an ISR or an ASR. Or, hey, did anybody check out the new Catalyst 8000 switches? Those are exciting. Wait, Catalyst 8000 edge platforms. They're not switches. Really, they're routers. But Cisco doesn't want to call them a router. I don't know why. But anyways, so the new Catalyst 8000s is a uh, RA, is a Catalyst 8000 family is a routing platform that Cisco calls an edge platform. And is especially designed for SD WAN. Anyways, so <laughs> this fabric control plane node. We're just having a lot of fun today. Fabric control plane node. The purpose of this is to be our Lisp control plane uh, element. So, in an SDA fabric, again, a little bit of preview for next week. What's happening here is we want the switches because there are switches in this VXLAN domain. These switches. Just draw three of them for example. We don't want them to know about the clients. We don't need them to learn about the MAC addresses. We don't even need to learn about the routes. You know, if we've got the 192.168.100, I'll just write that out. 192.168.100.0/24. If that is VLAN 100, then these switches in here don't have a clue where VLAN 100 is from a subnet perspective. Like they're not, they don't know where 192.168.100 is. And the reason we can get away with that is because we're going to encapsulate it into a tunnel and not send it towards 192.168.100. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter because, uh, never mind. I was thinking we're sending it away from that subnet, but that subnet lives over here as well. So we're not sending it towards that IP address. Instead, what we're doing is we're sending it towards the IP address of that switch. So we're going to send it to that switch there and say, hey, get me to switch. I don't know. Maybe this is switch three. Get me to switch three, right? And so this switch is just doesn't have a clue that we're sending it to VLAN 100. It just knows I'm sending it to switch three. So switch three will get that packet and de-encapsulate it. See, oh, this is destined towards dot 100 and forward it down to the appropriate client. So the question is this, how does this switch right here, how does it know where to go. If I'm sending it to dot 101 or what have you, it's going to receive that packet and it has to know to send it to switch three. So how does this switch know to send this packet along the path that we described to get to switch three? And the answer is Lisp. Lisp is the control plane. It's the one telling all of the switches in the environment where to send its traffic, especially those fabric edge nodes. And so as clients come online, we alert the control plane node to say, hey, I've got a client here. Hey, I've got this MAC address and I've got this IP address. And so the Lisp control plane node is basically sitting there and taking all this information in. And so when, you know, again, let's just call this switch two. So when switch two gets a packet in towards an IP address that doesn't know, it's going to send a message to that Lisp control plane node and say, hey, I'm trying to get to dot 150. Where's dot 150? And that control plane node is going to send back and say, oh, 150 is attached to switch three. And so I know to encapsulate that and send it on to switch three. One of the big concepts that we talked about a couple weeks ago, and we will keep talking about, is the idea of control plane and data plane separation. What that means is in a traditional network, I've drawn this before, but I'm going to draw it again. In a traditional network, if I have two boxes, let's call it router one and router two, I really have two different levels of operation happening here. I have the control plane, and the control plane is usually a routing protocol, maybe it's um, just the way I learn MAC addresses at layer two, it could be spanning tree, right? But if we think about it from an OSPF perspective, or yeah, well, I'll just use OSPF from, oops, there we go. If we think about it from a routing perspective, so we'll call it OSPF, we're exchanging OSPF information. They're exchanging those LSAs and building our database. And we use that information to populate our routing table, our RIB, right? And then the RIB gets populated into the FIB and the, we use Cisco Express forwarding. But all of that information comes from the control plane. At that point, the data plane is able to actually send the traffic to each other. So I take my, I get a packet in, I look up the information that I got from the control plane, and then I send it on. Now in traditional infrastructure, all the information I have is all the information I have. 
if I don't have a route to send something, I don't have a way to, to ask anybody, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's what, what the default route is for, is it tells me where in the world I should send a packet that I don't know the destination. But in the Lisp world, or software-defined networks in general, what we're gonna do is we're gonna separate this concept. We're gonna get rid of the idea that I'm running the control plane directly on the boxes. So instead, I'm relying on this control plane node over here on the right, and that control plane node is going to be the one that I go to and I ask. So it's no longer a, I've got all of the information and I've got to make all of the deci forwarding decisions on my own based on the information I have. Instead, I'm going to be given only the information I need and any other information I'm going to go ask about. I, I hope that was clear. If, you, if it wasn't, please ask questions because this is a very important concept within the world of SDA and all asterisk, right, caveat, but most, <laughs> if not all, software-defined networking applications. Cisco's ACI, application-centric application infrastructure, that's their data center platform for SDN, 100% uses the same methodology. The uh, SD-WAN, software-defined wide area network, Cisco's uh, SDN environment for the WAN, same thing. It's going to, it's using um, OMP as the control plane protocol, and OMP is overlay management protocol, it's sort of like BGP, but ultimately, I'm still, as, as the edge node, I'm like going and you know, hey, where do I where do I get this information from? Right? It's not I'm not exchanging that information directly with my uh, the other routers in the SD WAN space. Instead, I'm exchanging these routes with a control plane node. Um, it's definitely different in operation compared to ACI and and SDA, but it's still this concept of separation. This absolutely is is where we're where we're living in the networking world these days. So. Um, I, I, I will say again, not to not to just keep on the same topic, but for years I hated it when somebody would talk about control and split data plane separation because it didn't make any sense to me. I was really lacking the the glue like, to hold it together because you know you're ripping something apart and like okay, well I don't I don't even understand what that means. Like, is there a controller somewhere that's orchestrating things? And and to some extent, yes. I mean, we we see that, but Cisco makes intelligent boxes. And so um, if, if this, let me change colors again. So for example, if switch two down here at the bottom has a routing relationship, let's say it's running EIGRP with another box over here. I mean, technically, well, in an SDA environment, that's actually a bad example. Um, yeah, I, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> an SD-WAN, this is absolutely okay. From an SD-WAN perspective, your edge router would be able to form downstream routing relationships. And the purpose I was trying to, or the example I'm trying to make here is that we actually can you know, still have elements of control plane information on the box, uh, but we're no longer uh, doing that with SDA. And so that's actually a little different story um, from a fabric edge node perspective. That does apply to the fabric border node. This fabric border node absolutely is going to have other routing relationships, maybe an EIGRP upstream. And so in that sense, if I just started with fabric border, no, we would have been fine. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is there's still a lot of intelligence on the box. There's still the ability to run EIGRP, OSPF, BGP, spanning tree protocol even. You know, I mean, we, we've got the ability to run control plane information on these boxes because we're primarily deploying Catalyst 9000 hardware. And Catalyst 9000s are absolutely top of the line edge, uh, what, what, bleeding edge, I guess, a leading edge. It's, it's Cisco's modern switching platform and you don't have to deploy them into an SDA fabric. And so we wouldn't want to buy a switch that has no way of running OSPF because it's relying on Lisp. That would be bad. Instead, what we have is we have fully capable switches that again, like the fabric border node, in some cases we're going to have routing relationships, that's fine. But when it comes to the SDA fabric, when it comes to this VXLAN concept, if I'm gonna send something across the VXLAN overlay, I need to know where to send it. And these switches are not performing routing relationships with one another. And I think that's what's key. Again, ask questions. This diagram's getting pretty busy. So <laughs> if you've got any questions, chime into the chat. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully help you out with that. So hopefully that was crystal clear, right? Um, it's... <clears throat> 
for what it's worth, it's never crystal clear the very first time you hear it. It will take a few times hearing it, thinking about it, dreaming about it because you fall asleep while you're studying. Whatever the situation is, eventually these pieces start to form in your head. So be encouraged if you're if you're lagging behind a little bit, and that's a okay. Uh, the control plane node is again our Lisp. It's going to be handling our Lisp control plane information. It's what tells the rest of the network where to send things. The last thing, the last element is going to be a fabric wireless LAN controller. The uh, wireless LAN controllers are, are a little bit interesting in the SDA world because what we have is we have, uh, let me see if I can, I'm gonna get rid of the, 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 I feel the need to get to clean this drawing up. All right, we're gonna do this and I'm just gonna, oh, come on. There we go. I got rid of, I got rid of too much. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> I'm going to write fabric uh, wireless LAN controller again. Because we also have, by the way, access points. Fabric access points is part of this, but Cisco doesn't like really consider that to be a component. They talk about their four components. It'd be the edge node, the border node, um, the, oops, the fabric control plane node, and the fabric wireless LAN controller. These are the four main components of the physical layer, which is what we're supposed to be talking about here, in an SDA fabric. So if you're taking an exam and it's asking you for the four different roles, these would be the four different roles. But we do still have access points on top of that. Um, all that to say, the reason I cleaned up this drawing, the, the wireless LAN controller is interesting because it is actually designed such that Cisco wants it to hang off of the non-SDA domain. It doesn't want it to be part of like it, it, we can't hang a wireless LAN controller off of a fabric edge node. We can hang access points off of a fabric edge node, but we cannot hang the wireless LAN controller. So the wireless LAN controller can either directly attach to the fabric border node, or technically it could attach to some other switch on the network. It just needs to be off, um, off the fabric. What's interesting about the fabric wireless LAN controller is that if we're used to wireless communications, what we're used to is this. The access point is going to form a CAPWAP tunnel, and the CAPWAP tunnel is going to be where not just all of my control plane information goes, but also any clients that are connecting wirelessly are going to get shuttled up through that, uh, that tunnel. Uh, that is not how it works in the SDA world. We do still we do still form the CAPWAP tunnel and the control plane information is still trans, you know, going back and forth. Now when I say control plane information, I probably should call it more control information because it's less about building a control plane and more about just that, um, you know, what should my radio be at? And, you know, it's just management information. So maybe instead of control plane, I'll just call this management. So the management info is still going to go across the CAPWAP, but the client is actually going to get dropped off via a VXLAN tunnel that gets built between the access point and the fabric edge node. And yes, that means that the access points are capable of VXLAN. So everything's capable of VXLAN these days, uh, which is which is pretty cool. So th it's a much different paradigm in the wireless world, but under, you know, in the, the wireless paradigm is much different in the SDA world. So be aware of that. Um, again, we're not gonna drill into the details of some of this until next week, next session, but uh, yeah, so so we've got wireless LAN controllers uh, that are attached or part of an SDA fabric. That's when we call them a fabric wireless LAN controller. All right, the one, one thing that uh, we should be aware of as well in all of this is that these two roles right here can actually be combined on one device. So if I want to, this fabric border node could also be a control plane node as long as the hardware supports it. And so what we're about to do here is I'm going to flip over to Cisco website because I want to showcase all of the different types of hardware that we would deploy in this because we're talking about fabric edge nodes. Okay, what, what could be a fabric edge node? Could it be a, a 2960X stack? No, no, no. Okay, no, that's not going to work. We, it can't be a 2960. But we do need to know what platforms are supported and what roles. In most, of our, in most cases, we can actually combine a device to be a fabric border node and a fabric control plane node. Um, however, once a device is a fabric edge node, it can only be a fabric edge node. 
And the wireless LAN controller is kind of in its own category. So as you can imagine, we're not combining that with anything else as well. There is a pseudo fifth role. I guess we already sort of have a fifth role with the access points. But another pseudo fifth role would be the concept of, you see that? All right. I'm trying to stay outside of underneath. We'll call it an intermediate node. Intermediate, yeah, yeah, you get it. An intermediate node. The intermediate mode, remember when I um, drew three switches in here? These would be intermediate nodes. Intermediate nodes do not need to be Cisco. They can be non-Cisco. They don't, they don't have to be non-Cisco. Uh, the point is that they can be anything because all they're doing is routing between these different fabric edge nodes. Okay. Um, so that's cool. We could we could deploy some cheap switches in there. Now you would want it to be too cheap of switches, but um, you know, I mean, if you if you've got some old Cisco hardware, by the way, like again those twenty nine sixty Xs, well, those aren't layer three, or at least they're not super layer three. You can do some static routing, I guess. But um, I don't know. You got some old sixty five hundreds sitting around. You could throw those in there. Why not? Even though sixty five hundreds aren't really certified for anything else, we could uh, we could deploy them into the um, and as intermediate modes. So, all right, whoo. Um, still on the physical layer, let's check out that website. Um, this should do it. All right, good. That's not it. That's not it. Ah, there's it. All right, I just have to pull on my side. So, what devices can we use in each one of these roles? The safest answer you know, that, that you almost don't even need to look anything up is going to be to use Catalyst 9Ks. Cisco, um, for those who are unaware, once upon a time, they had Catalyst 2Ks, right? Like the 2960s, they had Catalyst 3Ks, uh, which were the stackable switches. They had Catalyst 4Ks, which are the chassis switches. Catalyst 6Ks, which are also chassis, but they're distributed model. Basically, they're core switches. And the 4500s were chassis edge switches or access switches. So they had all of these different switch models, and then a few years ago, they said, you know, knowing the SDA was coming, they said, we're going to simplify our portfolio. We're going to get it down to one line of switches, the Catalyst 9000s or Catalyst 9Ks. And the, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have like the 9200s be what the 2Ks were, really low end edge switches. The 9300s are going to be what the 3Ks were, stackable layer three edge switches. The 9400s will be what the 4500s or the 4000s in general were, chassis switches, uh, chassis edge switches. 9600s are like what the 6500s were and the 6800s. Uh, they do have a 9500 series switch. That The best parallel would be the 4500X. They're like fixed configuration core switches. All right, so the reason I say all that is Generally speaking, if you're going to deploy new SDA hardware, it should always be on Catalyst 9000s. That's where you want to land. Now you got to pick the right 9K for the for the role. You can't deploy a 9200 as a border node, for example, and you can't deploy a 9600 as an edge node. I don't think, but okay. So how do I find this information out? Ta-da! <laughs> this is how you find this information out. So we are on Cisco's website. Uh, if you just Google Cisco SDA compatibility matrix or Cisco, actually the way I found this was Cisco DNA center compatibility matrix. Uh, select new deployment. And what you're gonna do is you're going to pick the version of SDA. So if you're deploying a new one, always just pick the, the most recent version. And then over here, you're going to pick a device role. Now we just talked about these, the fabric edge node, the fabric border and control plane node. Remember a lot of, a lot of devices can serve as either one. So they combine these. Uh, wireless nodes. They do have these extended nodes. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but essentially what an extended node is, Cisco, so everything I just said about them like taking this type of switch and making a Catalyst 90X100, whatever, taking a 2K, making a 9200, they had quite a few switches that were designed for hard places like factory floors and um, harsh conditions, harsh weather conditions and, and such. They had a bunch of these switches, and, and most of them are in the industrial Ethernet line, the IE 3Ks and, and such. And so um, rather than making a version of 9K that would replace those lines, they just took those and basically made it so that DNA Center can manage them in such a way that when they hang off of a Fabric Edge node, then they can participate in the SDA Fabric. They're not building VXLAN tunnels, 
but they are still able able to be installed as part of a certified DNA center managed SDA environment. All right, so that's that's all we're going to spend the time talking about extended notes. So we, we look at these. Um, we're going to look at the let's just look at fabric edge notes. So this is what I had pulled up when we flipped over. And so what we're going to find is we're going to find all of the different devices that can serve as a fabric edge node. So for example, we've got the 3850s and the 3650s. This is probably well and the 4500 E's down here. These right here are pretty much the only legacy switching platforms that we can leverage in an SDA environment. And we got to be careful because the 3650s, these are going to work as a fabric edge node, but they won't work for other roles where the 3850 can not actually serve as a border and control plane node. Same with the 4500E. So when we look at it, if for example, we're going to upgrade and we would say, hey, we've got some 4500E sitting here. Can we use these? And you look and you're running Supervisor 7E on the 4500s, well, we're out of luck because we can only run this as an 8E or a 9E if we have those supervisors. And the reason for this is because it needs the right chipset. Cisco relies on the Unified Access Data Plane or UADP chipset that first showed up in the 3850s, the 3650s, the 80s and the 90s. Even though, even though they didn't have SDA figured out yet, the UADP is a programmable ASIC, the first of a of its kind, really. I mean, they're on UADP. I think they might be on 3.0 now. I know it's been a while since I looked it up. They're at least on 2.0. I mean, they've, they've continued to evolve this chip, this programmable ASIC, which is a little bit of an oxymoron for those who know what an ASIC is, because an ASIC is an application-specific integrated circuit. And integrated circuits are hardware designed with a special purpose in mind, and you can't change what the ASIC does. And yet it's programmable, hence the oxymoron. So uh, 30, best example, 3850s, 3650s, they could not support VXLAN when they came out. Literally could not support VXLAN. Now you might say, okay, well, that's great. They could just program it in, right? VXLAN needs to be in hardware. VXLAN takes a lot of resources to do in software. And so, yes, they could have just coded it into iOS XE and made it so that they can form software tunnels using the CPU, but can you imagine every packet going through the CPU? That wouldn't have that wouldn't have flown. In order for the 3850 and 3650 to truly support VXLAN, they needed to do it in hardware. And if not for the UADP, they would have the only way that they would have been able to do it is to release an updated version with a new chip. Or, you know, not that they would ever do it, recall all the 3850s and swap out the chipset to have actual hardware in there that can support VXLANs. That's the miracle that this UADP was, and in a lot of ways, saved Cisco's bacon, or, or maybe put another way, allowed Cisco to actually push SDA forward. Because as happens with a lot of you know these companies like Cisco that are huge, and they invest literally billions of US dollars into developing some of these switching platforms, for them to then say, hey, you know what? It's great that we just came out with these 3850s and 3650s and we've started selling them by the millions, but guess what? Uh, software-defined networking is kind of a big thing and we need to jump on this bandwagon and we really need to support switching platforms or we need to we need to launch a switching platform that can support it. Cisco would not have had the choice of doing that if the 3850s and 3650s would have le been left behind. Instead, by bringing the 3850s and 3650s, which were only a couple years old, by bringing them along, by updating them and making them support VXLAN, they could go back to their customers who have purchased these switches and say, hey, I know you bought those, but guess what? They're compatible with an SDA fabric. Well, that allowed them to actually go through the process of developing SDA. Um, if not for that, they might have been left behind in the SDN space because they, I doubt they would have gone forward with a solution that would have made obsolete their brand new switch line <laughs> uh, that a bunch of their best customers are already invested heavily into. So um, all that to say, we can use this compatibility matrix to figure out what platforms should go onto uh, into which roles. So we're, we're looking at Fabric Edge Node again. This is where the Catalyst 9K line comes in. So we see 9200s, 9300s, 9400s, 9500s. We're going to notice that there aren't the 9600s. That's what I said earlier and then doubted myself. But yeah, the 9600s can't actually be used as a Fabric Edge node. Interesting. So we come back up here. Let's look at the border and control plane nodes. 
Now, remember, the border and control plane nodes, uh, well, I should say the, the control plane node specifically, is going to be able to be a um, uh, the routing platform. I guess the, the fabric border nodes are as well. I just, you, I don't see a whole lot of designs involving ASRs and ISRs in that role. But interestingly, again, we do see not only the routers, the ASR line, but also the 3850s. Well, that's that's interesting because we just talked about, hey, this is an older switch line. 3650s don't make the cut. The 4500s didn't make the cut, but the 3850s have the layer three table space that they can store the LISP information. That's again, part of that UADP programming because it needed LISP. It didn't, it also, you know, 3850s weren't able to run LISP uh, until then. So 6500s actually are still supported. Um, you gotta be careful. You gotta make sure you have at least a soup to uh, 2T. You can always expand this for more information. So uh, 6800s as well. Uh, this is, again, interesting. The 6800s did not show up on the edge nodes. It only shows up here in the control and border plane or control plane and border nodes. Yeah, nailed it. So uh, this is an interesting one down here, by the way, the Nexus 7700. Because the Nexus 7700 is a data center aggregation switch and there's a lot of customers out there with them, uh, they did decide to support the 7700s as a border node only, okay? So a um, a border node, an external border node, which is actually a um, a little bit of an old way of saying it because now it's an anywhere border node. Uh, there's internal, there's two different types of border nodes. And so either way, it's, it's capable of being a border node, but it's not capable of being a control plane node. We notice this here. Um, same thing with the cloud services router. This is interesting. It can actually serve, this is the virtual router. This can serve as a control plane node. Uh, it can't be a, a border node because it's a virtual router. Um, so I guess that makes sense on some level, but it could at least, we could deploy it into our data center. We could allow it to be the fabric control plane node. Okay. Um, last but not least, we can look at the wireless side and we'll see all of the different types of access points. For the most part, if it supports AC, it's going to be supported from an access point perspective. So that's all of our Aeronet um, 1000, 2000s, and 3000s. These are the older access points at this point. Hard to, hard, hard sometimes to stop and think like, oh man, those 3800s that were so awesome a number of years ago are, are considered old, but they are. Um, instead, what we have, well, where are they? There they are. So the 9100s, I don't know if you've heard about this, but the Catalyst 9K series, the Catalyst in general is no longer restricted just to switches. So we talked about the, you know, the 9200s through the 9600s. Well, guess what? The 9100s are access points. The 9800s right here are wireless LAN controllers. So the Catalyst line is really Cisco's only line anymore. I mean, they're developing everything within the Catalyst line. So 9100s are access points, 9800s are the wireless LAN controllers. And I mentioned earlier, the Catalyst 8000s are the replacement for the ASR 1Ks and the ISR 4Ks. So we have these Catalyst 8000s that are now routers. So it always used to be Catalyst was the switch line, but now Catalyst is really Cisco. I mean, for all intents and purposes, we're going to be playing only Catalyst equipment um, in a lot of campus environments. All right, so we spent too much time on hardware. Where are we at here? About 15 minutes left. And we're still on physical layer. This is why we don't try to buy it off too much. Um, but again, I mentioned we we're gonna spend a whole lot of our time here. Let's go ahead and flip back to, is it this one? All right, yeah, it is. Okay. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's clean this drawing up a little bit. Dun, 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 dun. All right, that'll work. All right, so network layer. That was the physical layer. Let's jump into the network layer. And again, this is <laughs> SDA architecture we're talking about. All right, so if you can read my handwriting, my goodness. Okay, so we're talking about the network layer now. What is this network layer all about? Really, it's divided into two different categories here. We've got the uh, well, hold up. Okay, pa hit, hit the brakes for a moment. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the actual control data plane, um, what Cisco calls the policy plane. Again, we've got layers and planes all over the place, 
But what we have is, we've talked about this already, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. At the control plane, we are running the location ID separator protocol or LISP. At the data plane, we are running VXLAN, virtual extensible local area network. And at the policy plane, this is interesting. Cisco kind of made up a word. That's okay. We all do like to do that every now and again. Made up a word called policy plane, and we use Cisco TrustSec or CTS at the policy plane. This is going to use this concept of scalable group tags or SGTs in the fabric. The idea of an SGT, which at one time was called a security group tag, SGT. Uh, actually, the acronym didn't change, did it? So there was security group tags. Now they're scalable group tags. You'll still hear me and others just slip up and call them security group tags. But what the SGTs are going to do is going to help our network enforce policy. Um, and so again, we're not going to spend, uh, we'll, we'll dive into more detail in two weeks. I don't even want to start to talk about it because we'll find a little bit, look over and we'll be out of time. So just understand we're these three different planes of operation are running three different protocols, LISP, VXLAN, and Cisco TrustSec. Um, absolutely, this is fair game for the Encore, for the design course. There's a lot of, I mean, it's about as high level of a question as you can get is what protocol is SDA run at the control plane? LISP, BGP, I don't know what, but uh, VXLAN. So just understand that we need to memorize this as well. Uh, once you've spent time in this, you're not going to have to have memorized it. But as you're first learning it, you know, you'll you'll need to know it. Okay, now we're splitting into two conversations. Let me change color since we're changing conversations. We have the overlay and we have the underlay. Then I started to spell network. I have no idea why I started to spell network, but I did. Overlay and underlay. Okay, so. We'll start with the underlay, actually. I wrote these backwards, but that's fine. Um, the underlay is going to be all of the switches in here. So all of these intermediary nodes that we talked about. And these are going to have direct connections to the fabric edge nodes. So even though we didn't draw a whole lot, and maybe there's even two connections here, right? Um, this is, it's really just the, let me back up a moment here. So when we're talking about SDNs, in all, almost every case with software-defined networking, we're talking about building tunnels to the ed other edge switches. So we really want to have almost like a circular network where we've got this cloud in the middle, like what we have drawn here ultimately, but we've got this cloud in the middle of a bunch of switches, and we don't care what happens in there. And really what we're doing is we're building all of these switches around this cloud that are all connecting into the cloud at layer three. And yes, running a protocol, we're... We're running a routing protocol in here because we need to exchange subnets. But then on top of that, we're going to build tunnels. And so we're going to build a tunnel from, from my fabric edge node to your fabric edge node. And we're only going to exchange routes, not with each other directly, but with that Lisp control plane node. So I'm going to know to send traffic to you because you've got certain clients attached, right? When, when I know need to find out where I'm sending something, I'll ask the list control plane node, I'll chuck it across via a tunnel, and the underlay never needs to know where that traffic is going. So here are the key points of the underlay. We can make this underlay, believe it or not, layer two or layer three. Now I have only ever called this a layer three fabric in any of our conversations, and that is because it absolutely should be a layer three underlay. The only reason you could deploy it as a layer two underlay, well, I shouldn't say it like that, it absolutely will work as a layer two underlay. If it's layer two, then all of these switches are going to be on the same subnet. And I don't even need to run a routing protocol. I'm just going to be able to ARP for switch two's MAC address, and I'm going to be able to route right to it. And that's great. But if I have to do that, what do I have to run in this environment? I mean, I just drew all these network loops. You have to run spanning tree. And one of the reasons we're going to this architecture is to get rid of spanning tree and to get rid of these looped layer two domains and, and period, just to get rid of layer two domain. We don't want layer two anymore. We're sick and tired of layer two. So I could build my underland layer two. And in general, the only reason I would do that is if I have an existing layer two under like network and I'm slowly converting. And so while I'm converting, it'll be layer two, but then at the end, I'm going to flip it all over to layer three. But let's like make sure we're building these on layer three, uh, <laughs> a layer three underlay. Um, it does need to, if assuming it's layer three, we need an interior gateway protocol. And Cisco does recommend ISIS for this. 
tell you why in a moment. Next, we, uh, we do need to consider maximum transmission unit, or MTU. Uh, and we really should consider bumping it up by, I'm going to say, I, like my notes say 50, 50 bytes, but you got to be careful with this. If it's SDA, if it's truly SDA, the answer is 50 bytes, okay? VXLAN can carry the, VN, the VLAN tags. Now, if you're going to carry the VLAN tag, um, that's four bytes. And so you really need 54 bytes. So if this is a just a VXLAN environment and you, you know, you're going to do whatever it is you're going to do with VXLAN, then you probably want to increase it by 54. But SDA does not use the VLAN header, uh, the VLAN tag. It actually just takes those bits and merges it into the extremely long uh, VXLAN header information. And so it just it just throws those bits in there. So we're like, we don't even need to, to bring VLAN, the VLAN tag along for the ride. And so it's only 50 bytes. Now understand with tunnels, if you don't hit the, like if, if you forget this part and you don't increase it by M the MTU, everything's gonna work fine. And the reason everything's gonna work fine is because these devices are great at network segmentation. Well, not where it works. Wow, I don't know where that came from. Fragmentation. It kind of sounds, it kind of sounds the same, right? Um, they're great at fragmentation, and they can take a layer three packet. IP allows that, right? IP is great at taking a packet. It's too big, and we slice it in two, and we send it out. So at layer three, we can do fragmentation. At layer two, we cannot, because Ethernet and MAC addresses don't support that, Ethernet specifically. So all that to say, we should absolutely increase it, because we do not want to churn CPU cycles on our edge devices, fragmenting and defragmenting packets. But at the same time, um, just understand that as much as anything, the danger is you might forget this and everything is working and you're just going to have other issues with CPU utilization and take a while to figure out what's going on. If now one, one cool thing about the underlay is we can actually automate the underlay deployment via DNA center. So if this is a net new deployment and we're just, we throw a bunch of switches together, DNA center can actually go out and automate the deployment of the underlay, uh, which is, which is really cool. If it automates the deployment of the underlay, it is going to configure it as a layer three fabric. It will configure it at, or configure ISIS as the interior gateway protocol, and it will increase the MTU. The reason why Cisco recommends ISIS, even if you're not automatically deploying it, is simply because the more networks that are out there that are running the same underlying routing protocol, the easier it is for like TAC to troubleshoot it. The easier, you know, the, the fewer um, white papers are going to have to be out there for like how to run VXLAN across EIGRP fra fabrics and such, right? I mean, like the more consistent we can get, the better. So is ISIS magical? No, it scales a whole lot better than EIGRP or an OSPF, but the vast majority of our networks are not going to need the scaling of ISIS. It'll, you know, EIGRP would be great. Um, but it, it always comes down to that called attack and be like, you know, oh, so is your underlay running ISIS? Ooh, no, my underlay is running OSPF. Oh, well, all right. You know, we're not going to be able to maybe run our all of the same tests to figure out what's going on. All right. Um... Okay, I guess that's that. I don't really have anything to say about the overlay other than it's running VXLAN and we're going to cover uh, we're, we're going to cover VXLAN more later. Oh yeah, I got about seven minutes left. Okay, so that is the network layer. Any questions? Chime into the chat. <coughs> uh, controller layer. All right. So as always, <laughs> SDA architecture gonna be like I don't know never mind I was gonna make a joke about that being like the uh, the thumbnail for the video is gonna be SD WAN principles crossed out with SDA architecture written on it uh, controller controller layer we have two actually layers we'll just talk about them both right now uh, we got the controller layer and we've got the management layer you know what I'll use a different color for management layer so controller layer Here's what we need to know about the controller layer. We have DNA center as our controller. We have not mentioned it much up until this point, a couple of times, but really somewhere on the network, we have DNA center running and it's just a node It's probably in your data center somewhere. Um, and it's, it's automating a lot of this. So this is primarily going to be the way that we interface it, which we're gonna be talking about in the moment with the management plans, what the whole purpose of the management layer is. Um, 
DNA Center is controlling it. DNA Center consists of two subsystems. We have the Network Control Platform, or NCP, and we have the Network Data Platform, or NDP. Um, I believe we talked about it last time, but for those who have heard of APIC EM, Application Policy Infrastructure Controller Dash Enterprise Module, oh my goodness. Cisco's APIC EM platform was it, it was an automation plat. It was, it was what Cisco was originally developing to be their automation platform before DNA Center. And so when they created DNA Center, they essentially rebranded APIC EM and made it part of the subsystem, or part, well, it made it a subsystem, part of the DNA Center controller. So NCP used to be APIC-EM for those who have used APIC-EM. If you haven't ever used APIC-EM and never heard of it, that's just a history lesson. It doesn't actually affect anything. The network data platform is going to help us with this concept of network assurance. Network assurance is all about running essentially big data analysis on the network at any given time to try to figure out what's going on and what might go on and you know all of the dangers that lurk out there. And so, um, oh, and then so, that's DNA Center with the two subsystems. We also need to worry about the Identity Services Engine or ICE, okay? So DNA Center and ICE are our two controllers. And as part of DNA Center, we have the NCP and the NDP, okay? That's what we need to know about the controller layer. So I'd use a different color for management. Let's do it. The management layer. Okay, so the management layer is essentially how are we accessing this? We mentioned DNA Center, so we've got DNA Center here on the network, it's connected in. The way we are going to manage this environment is primarily by GUI. Now that's that's for most of us, we're gonna use a graphical user interface, but the, the thing that we need to, to think about and realize is happening under the hood is that we actually have this GUI as a separate process that's running on the DNA Center controller, and the GUI is going to run the REST APIs on the back end. So when I am here on the GUI configuring DNA Center and making changes and clicking buttons and, and things like that, the GUI is gonna turn around and execute all of that against the DNA Center engine using the REST APIs. So the other option we have is simply to use the REST APIs ourselves. Now, there's a lot of different ways of using REST APIs. We think about uh, Postman, we think about Python scripts we could write. Uh, there, there's all kinds of ways that we can leverage this. The point is simply that we, we have those two as our primary way of managing this environment. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. Um, Cisco does have a four-step process that once you log into the GUI, you're gonna see this. I'll go ahead and write it down real quick for those who are taking notes. They call this the design, I don't even have this memorized, design policy provision, policy provision and assurance. So this is sort of the life cycle of deployment. So you're going to do a design and there's, there's tabs at the top of the GUI, you go through the design process, you set policies, you essentially deploy those policies and then assurances is sort of that. Anybody remember the PPDIOO? cycle life cycle of, of, of the, the network the assurance is essentially the optimize uh, portion where you're just like you know what what's happening is, is, are there are there bad things happening I, I just mentioned assurance over here uh, that network data platform is essentially just taking all of the think of it like syslog and SNMP information um, these days more modern it's taking telemetry information but it's taking all that information and crunching those numbers against internal processes and kind of trying to figure out, hey, we're having problems here. Or, you know, when, when somebody does report a problem, you can go back in time and see what's what's going on there. So um, network assurance is absolutely a big part of the SDN world. So um, if everyone can stay, I know we're just about out of time. We got like one minute left here. I'll probably take four more minutes and I want to kind of show I just want to I just want to make it a little bit more down to earth as far as what we're talking about here because we can spend a lot of time a lot of time in the theoretical world and never really apply it to real life. Here's a lot of what we have. A lot of our networks look like this. We have distribution switches and they're connected to each other at usually layer 3 and layer 2, some kind of like maybe a trunk when we're routing across SVIs or maybe dedicated links. 
Um, these are coming down to all kinds of different access layer switches. I mentioned that we had probably, what, 20 closets times two. Some of them had three. I mean, we I think we had like 45 switches. It's been 10 years. It's been a while. But we had a ton of access layer switches. And so you've got all these access layer switches out there, and they're all connected up to these distribution switches. And then we've got the core switches. Now, sometimes this is a collapsed core, so if this isn't a true... Uh, a true layer three core, then then so be it. Maybe the core is collapsed into the distribution layer, but either way, we have core functionality happening here. And then maybe we do have data center switches. So uh, I'll draw it like this. I, I robbed myself of room here. So we've got aggregation switches. Those would belong to the data center. And so we've got like a full mesh connection to the data center. So this would be the data center. And then maybe we've got WAN circuits out to different remote sites this way. And so we've got access switches out there. So when we're talking about SD access, and we draw our pretty cloud with VXLAN, and we draw all of these fabric edge nodes and border nodes and everything, what in the world does this look like? <laughs> Ultimately, what are we, what is this, um, what, what are we trying to accomplish here, I guess? How do we get from this network that I've just drawn to an SDA fabric? Here's how this is going to play out. These access layer switches are going to become, whoops. Come on, there we go. These are gonna become fabric edge nodes. Same thing up here. We can have fabric edge nodes that exist across a WAN. As long as we meet certain metrics on our wide area network, then we can make those as part of the fabric. And pretty much everything else is the underlay at this point. Because remember, what we're doing here is we are going to build this SDA world. Uh, I'm going to draw it, let me draw it here for a moment. Uh, this cloud that is going to be our, our fabric. So we're going to build all of the overlay. We want to turn all of this into layer three. Now, it, beforehand, I didn't draw it on here, but most of the time, we're gonna have layer two now, links down to the access layer. So let's say we convert all of these to layer three. Now let's say that these distribution switches are now intermediary nodes. Remember, they don't have to be Cisco switches, but it doesn't really matter because they're no longer routing very much. They're just routing from endpoint to endpoint or fabric edge node to fabric edge node. Even the core switches become intermediary nodes, which sounds kind of odd. And this is where our fabric comes from. We're gonna start forming VXLAN tunnels among all of these different switches. So we've got fabric edge nodes coming from above down here to, uh, to these sites, but then all of these access layer switches are gonna start forming VXLAN tunnels to one another as well. And so you've got this full mesh of VXLAN tunnels that are being formed. Meanwhile, we've just gotta have you know, a, a fabric border node, or I'm sorry, a fabric control play node out there that's going to do Lisp for us. From there, we, th the one part that we do need to inject is usually going to be a pair of fabric border nodes. These border nodes, the purpose of the border node is essentially to take all of this VXLAN information and translate it into, so, so when I say VXLAN information, really, it's Lisp. Because the Lisp is storing all the information it's got access to the Lisp control plane, and it's going to translate that into, let's say we're running EIGRP, or BGP, or some routing protocol. And so the rest of the network, remember this is that non-SDA domain. We can't run SDA in the data center, it doesn't make sense to, uh, for a lot of reasons. And so we put the fabric border nodes in there between the core and the aggregation switch, or maybe we even turn our core switches into the border nodes, that's certainly an option as well. And now we've got this capability of getting inside and outside the fabric. Because again, we need to enable um, this non-SDA host. So we've got servers up here that we're accessing. Well, these servers need to connect to the clients. How do we get the servers to be able to talk to the clients? Well, again, route it out to the border node, which means that we're taking all those Lisp control plane information and all, all of that control plane information, we're redistributing it into EIGRP or what have you. And then, um, then these border nodes are able to, use, again, use Lisp and figure out, hey, um, where in the network is this ho, this client? And then I forward out the appropriate VXLAN tunnel. 
So this is this is Cisco's vision. Cisco wants to get away from the three tier architecture um, that you know ultimately it's really less about the three tiers and the core switches and more about this layer two distribution to access switch um, uh, relationship. They, they, we want to get rid of layer two. I made a big deal of that earlier. We want to get rid of layer two. We want to get rid of spanning tree. And because we've converted all of our layer two links to layer three, we've gotten rid of spanning tree. Now we've always been able to update our layer two links to layer three, but that would always come at the cost of sharing subnets. Now VXLAN carries our subnets through the layer three domain. So we get the best of both worlds. It's the whole get your cake and eat it too. Uh, we can have layer three links and get rid of spanning tree and get rid of broadcast loops but we can still share subnets among access layer switches. So this is, this is again, how we would take a traditional infrastructure and start thinking about it in terms of software defined access. All right, that, not gonna lie, that was a lot. Um, thank you for staying an extra five minutes over for everyone who was able to do that and is watching it live. Um, yeah, again, SDA architecture, it's a lot of fun. I can't believe I thought I'd get all of this in with all of the conversation last week, <laughs> but um, uh, and, and sometimes it just there's a whole lot of information to cover, and you think you can do it in a short amount of time. Next week we will be covering fabric operation. We're going to go into more detail on how Lisp works, how VXLAN works. Uh, that's a lot of what we're going to be covering next week. Honestly, we will talk about TrustSec as well. So again, that's the kind of the the triple protocols that Cisco leverages to run to run the fabric. Um, and as part of that, we're going to get to see the packet walk. So as a packet shows up on an access layer switch, what does it do and what process does it go through in order to get the packet to the appropriate destination switch? So with that, I hope everyone has a great week and a great two weeks, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.